traded up in the draft to acquire the number two overall pick. This reportedly angered quarterback Sam Bradford, who the Eagles just re-signed in March. Now, according to our Adam Schefter, Bradford wants to be traded and won't be showing up for the Eagles' off-season program any longer. Skip? What should the Eagles do with Bradford? Stephen A. Smith, I would now auction him off to the highest bidder immediately. I would try to trade Sam Bradford. I don't know how much interest there is on the open market in Sam Bradford. The first call I would make would obviously be to John Elway in Denver. I don't know how much interest he would have. I'm not the biggest Sam Bradford fan, and now he has $22 million in guaranteed money that Philly owes him, which would have to be transferred elsewhere. But if, in fact, they believe so much in Carson Wentz that they're going to trade, they have obviously already traded up to the second pick to take Carson Wentz, we assume, though we don't know that for a fact, Whoever it is, even if it's Jared Goff, I, I'd start him. I'd throw him into the fire. You've got Doug Peterson, who's a quarterback guru. You've got Frank Reich, who's another supposed quarterback guru. John DeFilippo is your quarterback coach. Just go with it. And if you don't want to go with it, you've got Chase Daniel. You gave him some money to come with you from Doug Peterson from Kansas City, where Chase was there the last three years with Doug Peterson. So you know him. He could be your short-term placeholder starter until you got Carson Wentz comfortable enough to be your starting quarterback in a tough town, as you well know, in Philadelphia. So I, I, I wouldn't want Sam Bradford. I, I think it's the perfect time right now but to say, come one, come all, who will give us the most for Sam Bradford? Skip, I agree with you. I think he's got a lot of damn nerves. I mean, you know, he needs to get he needs to get up out of there. He's got some nerve. He's acting like a proven commodity who's getting screwed over when, in fact, all the Eagles are doing is looking out for their future by drafting a quarterback of the future. Sam Bradford didn't sign a five- or a ten-year deal. He signed a two-year deal, if my memory serves me correctly. So it wasn't a long-term investment for him. So why should the Eagles not look for a long-term investment beyond him? It comes across as incredibly childish and weak on his part considering how non-productive he has been but nevertheless I would get that I would get him out of there quick fast and in a hurry um, I try to get as much value obviously for him as I possibly could uh, but I would I would caution you this the Eagles are not a joke uh, they underachieved last year because of uh, of the ego of Chip Kelly but they're not a joke. And so when you consider some of the pieces that they have in place, uh, it's one of those situations where they can legitimately compete for a playoff spot in the NFC East. And to jeopardize all of that by drafting and then inserting a rookie behind center, uh, in, in the National Football League, I don't know how advisable that would be. But that's a separate and a part issue from getting rid of Sam Bradford. So would you or could you go with Chase Daniel? You know, he's bounced around. I, I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure about yeah. that. Well, I that, mean, that's Chase, what you'd Chase be Dan left with. I'm not, listen, listen, listen. Chase Daniels, to me, strikes strikes me as somebody who's very, very comfortable holding the clipboard. Yep. No, he's a quality backup. I, y y he will not embarrass you. I just don't know if, if he would get exposed if he started 16 games for you next year. That's what they'd well, be facing I mean, without Sam Bradford. I'm not saying the man doesn't belong in an NFL uniform, and I didn't mean it for it to come across as derogatory as I made it sound. What I mean by that is that, you know, you got guys in the league. There are backups who seem to be starving for an opportunity to be that guy. And then there are other backups who appear to be incredibly comfortable with being the backup. Yep. He strikes me as somebody who's incredibly comfortable, who's incredibly comfortable with being the backup. And I don't know if that's the guy to lead the Eagles, okay. but you may need him to do right. that if you're drafting a rookie with the number two overall All I know pick is if, plan on the before the season. If zone. you're willing to bet that much of a King's ransom to go up to number two to get potentially Carson Wentz, you better be sold on him. You better be so sold that you, you would not be hesitant to start him next year. Now again, I keep saying North Dakota State, I didn't watch him. I, I can't have a hard and fast opinion on him because I look at the schedule and you're about to go from playing North Dakota and South Dakota State and Jacksonville State to playing the Cowboys and the Redskins and the Giants potentially so I I don't know is he that mature is he that mature physically I, I have no idea he looks the part he acts the part he throws the part I just don't know if the quality of competition is such that he can make the immediate leap to the National Football League Okay.
A lot going we'll on see. in the NFC East. Yeah, exactly, Stephen A. We will see. But we have breaking news. Some happiness in Washington. I hope not, because I got to tell you, Stephen A., this is potentially a great move for the Washington Redskins. And it is hard for me to admit that as a Dallas Cowboy fan. But I said last week on this show, Jerry, get to it. Make a move for Josh Norman because he will be worth every penny that you have to pay him up to $15 million. And unfortunately, I don't know what happened. Jerry obviously didn't move quickly enough. Dan Snyder, as is his ways, his history, moved very quickly here, paid top dollar. Josh Norman is capable of living up to that contract. And I must admit that Josh Norman did a pretty good number on a hobbled Des Bryant of my Dallas Cowboys at Jerry World last Thanksgiving. Tony Romo, a few plays later, went down and out for the rest of the season. But Des caught two balls for 26 yards, a back-to-back 20-yarder, -back and a six-yarder in the third quarter when they were down 23-3. to So way to go, Josh. Then Josh took me on, took a shot at me from that locker room after the game. Fine. We've had Josh on the show. We're fine with him. But my point is, I, I got one shot here, and it's what I did bring up last week here on the show. I'm not sure that Josh's heart is going to be anywhere but in Charlotte. And now the Washington Post, Post reports that, that Josh did, in my estimation, crawl back to Dave Gettleman and the Panthers and attempt to sign the franchise tag tender that he wanted his agent to sign to begin with. And it was too late. And then I thought it was significant in his first interview he did with the Washington media. He couldn't bring himself to, to go, we, it was, you guys did this last year. You guys did this. You guys could be this. Because it's hard on him because clearly he wants to be a Panther. So my only hope is a Dallas Cowboy fan having to face him twice. Your hope is a New York Giant fan having to face him twice. Yep. Is that Josh never can quite get comfortable Wearing that those redskin colors. I don't know. You know, maybe maybe he'll just miss being just down the coast a little ways in Charlotte because clearly he loved being a Panther and he wanted to still be a Panther. He loved being a Panther. He wanted to be a Panther. So, um, you know, it's, it's never going to be as completely happy as he would have been if he had gotten this kind of contract from the Carolina Panthers because that's where he wanted to be. But at the same time, if he's scheduled to have the kind of impact that we think that he can have with him and Breland, with Culliver coming back healthy, uh, with some of the pieces that they expect to have on this side of the defensive side of the ball, who knows what the Redskins can end up looking like, particularly in the questionable, questionable NFC East. So that's what it comes down to. But the, the, the overwhelming emotion that I have uh, coming from all of this, Skip, is that this is a guy that was drafted in the fifth round. He comes out of Coastal Carolina. He works his way up through the practice squad and beyond. He ends up becoming a fixture on, on, and an impact player on a Super Bowl contending Carolina Panthers squad. And because his agent is there negotiating in a hardball fashion, you take the deal off the table. Now, I have no problem with Carolina saying, take it or leave it. This is what it's going to be. Take it or leave it. But to sit there and take the offer completely off the table while at the same time not even allowing him to come back and sign a one year tender offer. To me, that just reeks of bad business. That just smells to me. It smells in the fashion. I don't want to hear the Carolina Panthers and folks talking about family. It's all business. And I hope the players treat it exactly that way. Because, again, even though we understand business and how it goes, this is something a little extra. The guy comes back to you, makes you aware of the fact that he didn't know what his agent was doing. He's willing to sign the one-year tender offer, and you still say, no, we don't want you. We've moved on. I really, really, I, I mean, that just smells on so many different levels to me that if I'm a player inside that Carolina Panthers locker room and beyond, I'm looking at them with raised eyebrows. I don't ever want to hear the word family come out of their mouth again. Um, it's all business, and every man should be out for themselves, even more so than they were even before. Okay, but you're not being fair to the GM Gettleman because he made it clear they were $5 million a year apart on a, a long-term deal. So they thought Josh was a $10 million a year player. He wanted $15 million a year. 
So what's he to do? He says, I don't want this distraction hanging over my football team and my locker room all through training camp. We're not going to get this done. I don't want it hanging over our head through the season, through the regular season, because we're not going to get close here. So finally, he just cut bait. And you can't, it, it is a business. He's got to protect the family because it is a family business. So I can't blame him. Now, now maybe he made a mistake. Maybe Josh was worth $15 million. If, if that's the case, he made a big mistake. Now Josh has the great opportunity, the golden opportunity, to go right up to D.C. and show him what a huge mistake he made. Well, Skip, I think your argument is strong if you are consistently that way no matter what, if that's your culture. Like if Bill Belichick did something like this, Skip, it would not bother me at all because that, those kind of decisions are applicable to any and everyone because we've, we've gotten to the point where we literally call it the Patriot way. It's the way they do business. I have no problem with that. It just seemed to me this is somewhat isolated. What was done here with Josh Norman, I'm not sure, would have been done with various other players. And there are plenty of situations, Skip, where guys have, are, are approaching the last year of their deal. And you have a concern about whether or not there'll be a distraction, but you're willing to take the opportunity, number one, because of their level of production, number two, because they'd be playing with a chip on their shoulder and may have something to prove and could go out there and perform. Number three, you never know what could transpire within the next year, whether their value diminishes, whether their demands dissipate, or whether you come up. You just don't know. I'm saying to you that this is not an average team. They were 15 and one. They went to the Super Bowl after going 17 and one because they won their two playoff games. It was the chemistry and cohesiveness combined with the talent that got them there. And you are willing to disrupt this because a guy thinks he's worth X amount of dollars. If you don't agree, then here's the one year offer, take it or leave it. But to not give him an opportunity to sign the one-year offer where he essentially is taking all the risk because he's the one that has to go out on the field and perform. He's the one that has to avoid injury. He's the one that has to do an abundance of things. You can simply cut bait with him after next year if you wanted to. To sit there and take the off, if that was the case, why put the one-year tender off on the table for him to begin with? You knew what he was going to look for. It's been reported for months what he thought he was worth and what he was going to come for. You knew what you weren't going to give him. What's the big deal? Well, from my two cents as a Cowboy fan, I hope he proves not to be a $15 million player in Washington. I'm right there with you. You yep. would say that. But congrats to him being the highest paid corner now in the NFL. Much deserved there. Coming up next, Penn State head coach James Franklin joins us. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, One of the funniest guys in entertainment stops by the desk. Keegan Michael Key, he's here. Come on out to talk his new movie, Keanu. And we'll talk a little Detroit sports, too. How are we doing? Welcome, Good. welcome, welcome. Good. How are you? I like the polka dots. Here. Nice you to like People don't know you. about Thank that. You Details. Much. The polka dots. Yeah. What's going on, man? <laughs> hey, Steve. Back in a minute. How you doing, bro? Good to see you.